Aula, ähm, Camilla hat ja beschrieben, dass die Erfahrung der ähm, chilenischen Protestbewegung auch was mit den Gewalterfahrungen der, des Regimes unter Pinochet davor zu tun hatten und auch die Entscheidung, sich so zu organisieren, wie sie es gemacht haben. Wie ist das in Ägypten gelaufen? Wie hat ähm, die gesellschaftliche Situation und auch die Erfahrung äh, der repressiven, des repressiven Regimes unter Mubarak die Protestbewegung in Ägypten beeinflusst und was hat äh, die Et Protestbewegung in Ägypten darüber hinaus beeinflusst, beispielsweise die Bewegung in Tunesien oder gab es für euch auch Bezüge zu den lateinamerikanischen Bewegungen und zu Chile? Thank you. Excuse me, because of how my voice would be a bit irritating because of the cough and flu I'm already having. Can you hear me? Great. I'll try to be jumping between different points that I feel like uh, they might answer Heike's question and might be interesting for the exchange between us. Um, I'll try to be as fast as possible. Uh, because I, I, I feel like there are four or three things that I want, would like to uh, map here. Um, for example, I would, first I would like to thank everyone, and especially the <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and the very inspiring speakers who spoke before me. And, and I'm kind of building what I would say on uh, what Professor Alex was saying and Camila was saying, and I thank them a lot and the panelists as well. And thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> On the background, uh, what was inspiring is we, Tunisia was inspiring. Tunisia was ignored by everyone at the beginning, but not in Egypt because of two reasons. One, for the left, it was inspiring because that was the workers' union, which meant there is something happening here on a different ground. The second thing is, Tunisia for us is a kind of country that was totally repressed. Bin Ali slaughtered the opposition, really. So for them to do something, and I'm not talking about when Bin Ali fled, I'm talking about before that. It was, even in those days, was still inspiring because for us, this was a very courageous thing. Where That's where the difference in Egypt comes. Someone, a, a British, um, political scientist was just writing an article last weekend, or last month, I mean, and she was saying that when Tunisia presented the inspiration, Egypt presented the model. And that's where a bit of, I would come to the, the background that is specific to Egypt. In Egypt, we're kind of building this revolution that's just started, just started, on 10 years of uh, uh, movement. Uh, and we're, of course, those 10 years are being built on the 70s and before them the 50s, where actually the left was very strong on the 70s and the 50s and was hardly and violently oppressed as well. This movement that is not a lefty movement, this revolution that we're in that is very specific, where the left is, is playing a very crucial role, but where the society doesn't see it as or want to recognize it as a social uh, movement thing and where we also the left need to be realistic about where the social movement is in it and when would it be leading such a revolution because it's not yet and it's a bit far from doing that now and we need to know that we need to work on that and understand it as well and not resist it and resist recognizing it now when we started with the Intifada and the Iraq War and, and, and um, protesting against the invasion of Iraq, that was the first time a chant against Mubarak was chanted in the Egyptian streets. That was the first time someone would say down with Mubarak and that was uh, a, a president, uh, something that we celebrated on that day. We occupied the Tahrir Square in 2003, but no one heard about us because we had to flee the Tahrir Square because of the violence we faced, and we never went back, but in small numbers, of course. We never really occupied it. 
And then a continuation of movements happened. The movement for change with the elections, the 2005 election, uh, the movement uh, uh, of the judges' independence, and then uh, the social movements and the uh, social demands, and the Mahalla 2006 um, big uh, event in April 6, uh, and then later on the anti-torture movement. So we're building on, and the students' movement in the last four years, we're building on all those. I personally was involved in a group called Tadamun, or Solidarity, that has nothing to do with the Solidarity Polish uh, movement. But uh, in Tadamun, we were a bigger umbrella of uh, workers' movement and, uh, and, we're, and, and socialist activists. Uh, which made, uh, actually represented a problem in my uh, revolutionary socialist organization because we had a dispute over should you build your own revolutionary party or help build alliances. And then we had a split and that's why I'm part of uh, the socialist renewal current while other comrades are part of the so revolutionary socialist organization. We're both the only Trotskyan uh, traditional tradition uh, organizations in uh, Egypt. The Socialist Renewal Current is part or founding part of the Socialist Popular Alliance Party. We are kind of the radical front in it. Uh, it's a wide left party. It should not have been called the Socialist Popular Alliance Party. I would have preferred that it's left as the Popular Alliance as it was meant to be, but they kind of loved and like to have the sexy socialist word before their name, even though the program does not really represent a socialist program. And I, I as a, a revolutionary socialist, I wanted the party to be wider. I do not think we should be stuck with thinking that only with a revolutionary party will start a revolution. The revolution already started and the society is not ready for a revolutionary party. That's a fact. And those are one of the things we're facing now. With that background, what happened in the last year was Tunisia started and it was very inspiring, but also in Egypt and specifically in Alexandria, the All Saints explosion, the All Saints Church explosion happened, which was very crucial to us. One, because it was kind of enough is enough. People were really angry. People who are praying on New Year's Eve are being killed. And we all had our fingers pointed at the interior ministry. It was something planned, and later we discovered we were right. It was planned because they wanted to distract us from looking at internal issues, from looking at the anti-torture, very famous anti-torture case of Khaled Saeed in Alexandria as well. This guy who was not even an activist and got tortured, but his photos of, the photos of his body in the mortgage were spread widely everywhere, and then a movement started on his name. And then something very crucial happened three days after, on the 3rd of January. There were marshes in Cairo, and specifically in uh, an area called Shubra, which is heavily populated, and you don't have areas for Christians and areas for Muslims in Egypt, and uh, especially in Cairo. So this, if this is heavily populated, then you have a, 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 a big number of Muslims and a big number of Christians most probably in it. And this area is one of the areas where it's almost 50% Muslims and 50% Christians. And there were big marshes there. And we were participating. We, I mean here, the Socialist Renewal Current at that uh, moment, organizing and participating because we already had a good link with the Coptic uh, demands movement because we, of course, believe in um, refusing and resisting any kind of oppression. We had uh, comrades standing and, uh, uh, um, against the walls of a certain church in Shobra, in this area in uh, Cairo, to protect it. And the priest with a, uh, an officer who is a very religious officer, actually, a police officer, came out and chose four Muslim comrades of ours, specifically Muslim, because they did not want or could not afford to irritate more Christians. So they chose those four Muslim comrades who happened by coincidence to be four revolutionary socialists. They chose the most 
uh, active ones in that protest, the ones who were organizing, the ones who were trusted by the others, and they took them. And that was amazing. That was a great favor. Yes, they got beaten in the police station. I'm sorry for them. <laughs> But it was a great favor that they did to us. One, it gave us credibility, great credibility, because they knew we we're ready to pay the price for the beliefs we have. Two, it made us for start organizing for flash mobs, for to pressure in the uh, trial. They had a trial every Thursday and got postponed until the Thursday before the 25th of January. And we started planning for flash mobs. And because we're not that big, we needed to coordinate with others. We had to go and coordinate with other groups, like 6th of April, like the youth section in the Muslim Brotherhood, like the Baradri campaign, um, uh, different sections. We had to coordinate with other lefty and liberal and Islamist groups. And we had to bring them on and initiate, let's do something together for this case and for those four guys to come out because they were accused of like beating 27 officers, taking off buses. They were shown as supermen who've done amazing things that uh, no real person can really do and they were almost facing 25 years in prison. That made us think, and so why don't we also organize for the 25th together? and surprise, in a surprise way as well. The surprise way was not so much uh, accepted by the others at the beginning, but we come from a tradition when in the 90s, my comrades used to go to meetings, uh, to two hours meetings in, th in like three hours uh, transportation routes because they had to each go from a different way. Not all of them would know where the meeting is. They would each one go to a cigarette kiosk, for example, and then at that place they would find a letter telling them where to go and where is the meeting. So all this kind of um, very ambiguous ways of uh, keeping your secrecy helped us uh, offer a plan for what could be done on the 25th. Just to be honest with you, we never, we did not, while planning this, had in our mind that we are starting a revolution or we're helping start a revolution. We, what we thought is, we'll plan something very well, we'll protect, we'll, we'll announce 20 locations of marshes, but we will plan a certain marsh that will stay a secret till an hour before it, and I will tell you how we managed to do it. And only that marsh will be the one where we will condensate ourselves because this will break the siege on the Tahrir Square and we will enter it and we will be like maybe 5,000 occupying it for a few days and we'll bring down the interior minister and we're ready to pay our life as a price for it, but it's the interior minister, really. Only when the masses joined, we understood it's bigger than that. And only when we lost control, we understood then we're succeeding, it's amazing. If we've lost control, then it's bigger than us. And it means it's a bigger mobilization and a more successful one. So we, for example, had on a certain location decided, I, for example, had seven people I'm responsible for. Those seven, I, each one of them would bring 10. So I'm in total responsible for 70. I would meet them in the middle place. I would tell them in the morning, I fled my home two days before that, of course, to be able to reach that place without being followed. I will tell that one, the, the, the head of the 10 people, where the location is. He or she will not tell the others, but will take them to the place and will suddenly be there. This meant we distracted the security because they were there in the 20 places. And it meant also we, made, we managed to bring a certain big amount at the beginning. We agreed not to chant anything against Mubarak in that area where we started because it was a poor area. We only chanted about how are you really managing to provide school notebooks, something as simple as school fees, something as simple as food every day to your family. And that mobilized people, that brought people with us. And when we managed to cross an area after an area, that was a real surprise. It also was a learning experience because, for example, on the 28th, we did it again and it was a, another secret location and we reached Tahrir and we had to face at least five hours 
of confrontation. And on that nonviolence issue, I now speak. Yes, I think we're still a nonviolent. I'm, I'm, I'm not against us turning into a violent one, by the way. I'm just saying power relations measurements doesn't really allow us to be a violent one. It's not smart to be a violent one now. But if you're throwing rocks at people who are just shooting at you, it's still nonviolent. If on the 27th of January last year, we were thinking of Molotov, and yes, we were thinking, we have a meeting, a secret, highly secret meeting, that we laugh at because we call it the Molotov meeting. I think Molotov is, uh, yeah. And when you think of, and you agree that you're not using the Molotov to burn soldiers or throw it at people, you siege them with it, then you're still nonviolent. You know what you can do and you know what you can't and you want and insist on not really harming so much, but protecting yourself. I have four of my dear comrades who've lost their one eye. I have a comrade who've lost his sight totally because he lost in two different confrontations, both his eyes. And then I discovered that he's one of 1,200 people who lost their eye sight totally in this revolution. I can just give you a glimpse of how my day, and I'm just someone in this revolution, looks like. I, because now also I'm speaking about the notion of initiating and not just protesting against something. Because we're disobedient, we're also reshaping, yes. We have to reach an agreement. And so, for example, we're in a marathon. I came here without sleeping for two consecutive days, and that's why I'm, I'm, I think my body is not resisting and I'm getting sick. Because we're trying to get to reach an agreement where we are not just saying, let's go against the SCAF, the Supreme Council, the Military Supreme Council, but we're saying, and this is how we'll bring them down, and this is whom we want instead. Because, for example, as a, I was pa backing the, to jo the notion of us joining the election. Because as Lenin once said, if you cannot really boycott and make a noise while doing so, then participate, be there for the public to hear you, be a voice there. And we wanted to do that. Others accused us, ultra-leftists and other revolutionary socialists accused us of betraying the revolution for participating in this uh, elections. But we insisted on being there. Now we have a problem of, we have a, in, a, an only elected body, the parliament, but no politician wants to give it power, but the public wants to. And so we have to work on convincing your colleagues in other movements that we need to work and not just occupy Tahrir, but actually we need to leave Tahrir because we need to mobilize outside. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, just a minute and I'll finish, yeah. And you have to convince your other movements that we need to initiate one stand because that's only when we can actually propose something to people. We can't just say there are four proposals, let's choose one of them. They might disagree with it, but at least they might agree and that's one thing you have to do. And you have to also learn how to stand in front with a metal thing, with a garbage can, in front of bullets and tear gas. You have to just dance between those four or five different things that a, a, an activist in Egypt should be doing those days and that's a learning lesson, I guess. hat sich die ägyptische Gesellschaft durch die Protestbewegungen verändert und was sind die Herausforderungen, mit denen ihr jetzt konfrontiert seid? The important thing is to specify something at the beginning. Uh, they call it a youth revolution, and we hate that they do. That's a very bourgeois division of the society. They, instead of insisting on dividing the society according to who is with the revolution, who really has their best interest in this revolution to continue and to be victorious, and who are against it because their interest is somewhere else, Instead of doing that, it's easier to say it's a youth against other generations' uh, revolution. It's not true. Yes, uh, youth movements did start the sparkle, 
Yes, at the beginning we were the organized ones, the others laughed at us in a way, but we laughed at, it, at each other and ourselves at the beginning as well. But no, it's not just a youth revolution. Everyone is there and all kind of generations are there. I see very old men in the confrontations in the front line who refuse to accept that their age would not give them the ability to do the things others are doing and they do the things others are doing. Women are there, kids are even there, street children whom our now prime minister is saying uh, are not worthy of attention and if they die are not worthy of the martyrs uh, kind of stamp do participate, yes, 12 years old and 10 years old are participating, are occupying streets and are bringing in uh, and hunting tear gas bombs and bringing in supplies inside in the front lines, everyone is. Uh, the challenges we're, we're facing and, and that is affecting the whole society, that means my parents feel responsible towards the revolution as well. They would like not to announce that very loudly because they would really rather them participating than me. But um, we kind of dealt with that and had that fight six years ago and with that new thing, the confrontation, because that's new to all of us. The, the violence confrontation is not something, we've been beaten before, but not shot at with life ammunition and not shot, shot at with bullets and rocks and molotov from uh, above buildings because that's really, actually protesters now carry banners saying we prefer bullets, rocks from that high level uh, really do uh, cause more pain and we prefer bullets. We are choosing what they can kill us with. So my parents too feel responsible towards that revolution and they are held responsible and we're all hold, holding each other responsible. You're either with it or against it. And that's another thing that brings me to the challenges. One of the challenges is we're facing a media system that is totally in the hands of the enemy. And that means we're being discredited. As Camila was saying, people are hating us now. People who came with us year, a year ago, part of them are hating us. Some of them are being convinced. Some workers who have we've been with in protests before a revolution even starts think that we are the ones representing an obstacle in uh, their own progress uh, journey. We are the ones, they are not getting paid at the, at the end of the month. It's because they are telling them that only stability can uh, make this economy survive. It's not true, of course. It's not true. We're actually, the global thing is, we're all fighting against the new liberal uh, policies. That is, and one of the, very bad and very good things that the World Bank did to us is with the backing of Gamal Mubarak, the son of Mubarak, who was being prepared to be the president, that they were doing it so fastly and so fiercely in Egypt. The policies of the World Bank and the new liberal policies were being implemented in a very fast path the last five years. It was faster than ever before and that's why, and that was a, a struggle inside the regime itself because the older ones, that was a generation struggle. Felt like, let us do it, but just slower than that, because this is making all the bits and pieces we, we made available before to hush any momentum, not available now, and that's a bit dangerous. The gap is really wide now between the poor and the rich, and the poor are being so much pressured, the middle class is pressured, and the younger ones were saying, no, 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 this is better for the economy, better, more businessmen will benefit, and then the regime will be stronger. That is the reality, but are we able to relay this to the society? That's another challenge, because yes, the media is manipulated, but we are also have our own problems inside. Some of us have an exploring ego now, some of us became the stars of the revolution. Some of us could not resist the temptation of becoming a public figure. Some of us are not linked anymore with the ground base that they came from or that their movement came from. And some of us are also not realistic enough about the movement. We're facing a daily discussion with other ultra-leftists 
sometimes the anarchist, and sometimes all those very enthusiastic, very sincere. But those who think that only occupying, living in the square is the solution. But we're isolating ourselves. We are not mobilizing for the revolution. And then we're also facing the right wing, the things only going back, saying that it's a peaceful, nice protest, only marching. And then when they say go back, we go back, we obey, and maybe even get a permission before we march. Only then the society will accept us. I don't believe in both things. I believe we should be dis disobeying. When they say, go back when it's a march, we occupy. But then when we think that the occupation is getting weak, we leave the occupation and then make it, make a fuzz in the whole country, make ourselves present in everywhere. That's where, where initiatives like Kadibun, a new initiative that we started, which means Askar or military lies, is uh, beneficial. We started like those small videos of a SCAF press conference and every word he says, a personal in the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Military, a, word, a video in front of it that proves his lying. People we never heard of and people are not organized are bringing projectors and a white sheet and projecting and screening those things in different areas in Egypt, all over Egypt now. Only when we go back to trying to link the social movement to the democratic movement, and only we understand that we cannot be arrogant enough to think that only left and left left alliances can work, we need to ally with enlightened Islamists, we need to ally with liberals who have proved to be sincere to, the, to their democracy. I don't think democracy full stop is the answer, but I know there is a journey I can have with them, and then afterwards I can still argue and I can still present an opposition. Oh, I'll stop here. So not to take care. Danke, Ola, auch ähm, dafür, dass du uns daran erinnerst, dass äh, die Mühen der Ebene und des täglichen, der täglichen Auseinandersetzung ähm, wirklich existenziell sind für eure Bewegung, aber auch für unsere Bewegung. Was und wünschst du dir von den Protestbewegungen in Europa? Was braucht ihr und was sollte hier passieren? I, I, while coming here, I felt so guilty because uh, we're having an exciting weekend. Uh, it's the anniversary and we're planning for it and there might be confrontations and I'm leaving my comrades. But uh, then my group, the Socialist Renewal Current, insisted that actually we need to speak to others in Europe. We need to tell them that please don't look at our revolution in an orientalist way. It's not just wow, <laughs> wow, how nice it is. Now, there is a very deep analysis behind things and um, know the, as a revolutionary socialist, it puts me in pain, but no, the workers' movement is not close to leading this revolution, even though I believe their leadership is our exit for a victory. But they are not close to that yet. And no, we're not in a great shape all the time. But... Uh, that you need to know why, because such analysis means we're learning from each other and we learn also how to support each other. We learn that there are lots of things that need to be done and understood about the mechanism of each country in specific, but also about the mechanism of this global movement that is happening. I think there are lots of levels of participating that you can do. Uh, a professor that I read and made a book review on his book, and I can't remember his name, which shows how smart I am, I'm sorry, uh, said once, uh, he's an NYU professor, and he was saying that, for example, development, the problem of it is that someone makes the movie, but someone else buys the tickets, and someone else watches the the movie and so the movie maker never really knows if his movie is good or not because he was not tested by, he, the tickets were prepaid anyway, pre-bought anyway. That's one of the things that Germany is and in, in Europe in, in general is doing and is participating in, in, in doing in the region where I come from. You're paying for development from your tax money 
that is not really benefiting the countries you're paying the development for because you're not monitoring that because the countries that are paying are paying those money, this money to those NGOs that are doing those things without even actually having the link between those who are receiving the service, the, the receiving ad in that region, and those who are paying the money, you, the taxpayers. Development as such has a problem. And we as young people and as active people and as all people who have an analysis, we all have to have a stand against what's happening on, with, with our name used on it. What's happening because they say we need the money for this and that. They dictate what priorities are needed in my country. And they dictate what percentage of your money goes there because they actually want to control the relations between them in a certain way. We need to participate in that. We need to have a decision when it, when it comes to that because this is affecting things. On the other hand, we also need to think about our movement, our coordination together and strengthening our movement as something that is very important for that global change that is happening. They are working their magic on all of us. They are using the new liberal policies to convince different sectors and to work on pressuring different other sectors so we would not really concentrate on what kind of change we should do. And because of those new liberal policies, we're all actually angry and pressured. And we need to coordinate for this movement to be more in harmony because we're all facing almost the same monster. You, in Europe, the anti-cuts movement, for example, in the UK. Why is Europe facing such movements now? Because actually you had a surplus of wealth because you were a colonizing forces. We didn't have the surplus because we were colonized. Simple as that, your wealth, this surplus is finished, is ending, and that's why you need to start cutting on that, on that welfare system you used to just enjoy. Because actually capitalism cannot survive. It was just a temporary thing because he colonized other countries and sucked the resources of those other countries. That's gone now, and you need to, your systems need to face the, the, the reality of capitalism. We cannot really make us survive. We will not allow us to survive. We need to say another word is possible. Another reality is possible. We deserve it, and we insist on it.